The earth is a cradle and the sun a watchful guardian. Everything we have is powered by the sun in some way. Whether it is the compressed remains of life that soaked up the sun billions of years ago, or the cycles of weather that run the wind, or of course, the photons that excite depletion region electrons inside our solar panels. Around 2025, the radioisotopes of the furthest man-made object will fade, and it will cease operations. Voyager 1 is a testament to humanity's longing to explore the outer reaches of space. But just as much, it is a reminder that if we stray too far from our guardian, there is only silence and darkness. The sun will not let us out of its resplendent shadow unless we grow. Solve the block puzzles and brain teasers of physics. So the sun no longer remains an indomitable giant, but becomes a gentle friend whose children are finally ready to leave the nest. Let's go to Proxima Centauri and let's take the fastest aircraft we have, the SR-71. Two engines producing thrust of around 150,000 newtons each on an aircraft weighing 60,000 kilograms. So we could get an acceleration of 5 meters per second. Half of Earth's gravity. A pretty pleasant trip. No back aches or neck aches to worry about. And let's not ponder about the relativistic mass or air, etc. just now. We'll worry about them later. With continuous acceleration, we would be able to get there relativistically in just over a year. Five years would have elapsed on Earth. But who cares about those guys? Unfortunately, our fuel would last us part of the way there. Fossil fuels and chemical energy in general have a pretty hard limit on energy density. But there is another source of energy on our planet, one that is kept carefully hidden away on the high energy shelf, so we don't accidentally hurt ourselves. If we could somehow utilize the energy locked inside deuterium, we could go a lot further. Deuterium is abundant to the point of being infinite in seawater, and it's abundant in the universe as well. So we could even stop and refuel if required. Scientists all over the world have been trying to figure out this puzzle for a while now. While magnetic confinement with huge magnets is considered the most promising technology right now, they're also experimenting with inertial confinement. But there is yet another kind of fusion that has recently become an area of great interest for some NASA scientists. Lattice Confinement Fusion. Let's see what NASA did. They acquired some deuterium gas and put powdered metal in the same chamber with high temperature and pressure. The metal slowly became saturated with deuterons. One of the scientists involved said that the density of the deuterons at the end of this process was higher than if it was actual solid deuterium. Pretty impressive. Though, I really don't know how dense solid deuterium is. So, moving on. They accelerated a beam of electrons towards the metal lattice, where they were slowed down and deflected by the positively charged nuclei. Now, the electrons have lost energy by slowing down. That energy has to go somewhere. And it is emitted in the form of gamma rays, also known as Bremsstrahlung radiation. I've told you in the earlier videos that the strong nuclear force binding the nucleons together is really, really powerful. A hundred times stronger than the electromagnetic force. And the more the nucleons, the stronger the cumulative force. All the way up to iron in the periodic table. Deuterium being near the bottom of this curve means that its nuclear binding energy is the weakest. And a photon above 2.2 mega electron volts can break it apart. Which it does, breaking the deuteron into a neutron and a proton. The proton drifts off to find some electrons and other protons to hang with. The neutron, however, is at a loose end. A lot of spare energy, and it doesn't really care about avoiding positive charges. So it slams headlong into the deutrons trapped within the lattice, giving them high kinetic energy. This energy would normally not be enough to initiate fusion. But we have a specific environment here. Metals are excellent conductors of electricity, because the regular lattice structure allows electrons to move about freely. They don't have to be tightly bound to one particular atom. Because of this all-pervasive electron cloud, the deutrons are also lulled into a trance. And the neutrons slamming into them make more and more of them energetic. They frantically dance around in this drunken stupor. And blinded by the fog of negative charge, they begin to crash into each other and fuse. 
The products of this fusion process are helium-3 and a neutron, or a triton and a proton. The energy of these neutrons, according to scientists, is the smoking gun that proves that it is in fact fusion that is happening, because it matches up perfectly with results from other deuteron-deuteron fusion experiments. But we're not done. Because in the bubbling cauldron of deuterated erbium, another process is happening. Oppenheimer Phillips. Yes, this guy again. Some deutrons have successfully avoided being fused with other deutrons thus far. And they're moving carefully through the electron fog, secure in the knowledge that as long as they keep their heads down, they'll be okay. They don't really suspect any foul play yet. Or even when they feel themselves slowly changing orientation. But their fate is already sealed. Their neutron has betrayed them. Along with the fog of electrons, it obstructed their view to what was right ahead. An erbium nucleus. Now, a titanic struggle ensues, where the strong nuclear force tries to overcome the Coulombic barrier. But the erbium finally captures the neutron, flinging the proton away with huge kinetic energy. So, is this similar to what Fleischmann and Pons found in their ill-fated coal fusion experiments in 1989? Maybe. But keep in mind that while this is not a confined reaction, those gamma rays are not messing around. And there are still a lot of questions around these experiments. I don't have numbers for how much electrical energy was required to initiate the fusion reaction or how much thermal energy was finally produced. If you do, let me know and I'll pin the comment so we can understand how close to break even that is. Erbium looks pretty expensive, but unlimited space travel is pretty tempting too. Fission is obvious in many ways. It takes a ton of energy from neutron star collisions to make rare and heavy elements like thorium and uranium. They are unstable and prefer to be smaller, more manageable molecules, not huge creaking mansions that are always fissing and breaking down. Fusion is a little weirder. Hydrogen, helium, all these are commonly occurring substances, which are quite stable. It's a little unintuitive that transmuting them would create energy that we can extract for useful work. But I guess the laws of physics have no obligation to conform to our intuition. Personally, I don't have great hopes for this technology just as yet. I prefer more proof till I make a hype video about it. But according to scientists, it may one day power vehicles, satellites, spaceships, and maybe even the grid. I feel the word may is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. But still, there do seem to be some tricks, glitches and loopholes through which we can eke out some energy from the seas. Maybe even enough for a humble existence. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendation. I'll see you really soon. Bye.